Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for coming. I'm Jerry Sabloff, the president of the Santa Fe Institute, and delighted to see uh, such a terrific crowd. Uh, welcome to the, uh, our annual Ulam Lectures. Uh, they were inaugurated in 1994, so for all of us who can almost count, this is the 19th annual uh, Ulam Lecture. Uh, these lectures are, were named in honor of the great mathematician, the late Stanislaw Ulam, who was, you know, was part of the Manhattan Project and subsequently lived here in Santa Fe. As part of his legacy, his library now forms the core of SFI's scientific library today. As always, we gratefully acknowledge the support of the Los Alamos National Bank, uh, which underwrites our entire public lecture uh, program. It's my great privilege this evening uh, to introduce our 2012 Ulam lecturer, Bob May. Bob is a member of the SFI Science Board and I think is just a terrific example of an SFI scientist with his wide-ranging interdisciplinary interests and his concern with complex adaptive systems. I think without a doubt, he's one of the most important, eminent, and influential scientists in the world today. Although his PhD is in theoretical physics from the University of Sydney in Australia, he currently holds a professorship in the Department of Zoology at Oxford. A nice example right there of, of his interdisciplinary interest. He has held a number of other important positions, including Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK Government and President of the Royal Society of Britain. He was knighted in 1996, and in 2001, he was raised to the House of Lords in Britain as Baron May of Oxford. He has won numerous honors and prizes, as well as a host of honorary degrees. Uh, the, the, list, the listing on the website uh, takes up a considerable amount of space. Uh, trust me that, that, that he has been honored by the, the most uh, t important scientific societies around the world. He has written and edited a number of widely cited books in ecology and biology, and a huge number of scholarly articles, including such recent key pieces as Uses and Abuses of Mathematics and Biology and the famous Ecology for Bankers uh, that had SFI Science Board member Simon Levin as one of its co-authors. Among Bob's current interests is research on the factors that influence the diversity and abundance of plants and animals and the nature of their extinction. Bob will be giving uh, three lectures over the next three nights. Tomorrow night, he will speak on the topic of, and obviously of great importance, of uh, literally what is stability in today's complex financial systems. A far better choice, I would argue to you, to listen to than the presidential debate <laughs> where, where you already know what both of them are going to say, whereas you don't know what Bob will say. So, <laughs> This, this would be a much more adventurous choice to rejoin us tomorrow night. Uh, on Thursday night, uh, Bob will speak on topic of people and tomorrow's too small world. Tonight, he will examine the intriguing subject of beauty and truth in mathematics and society. He will consider the fascinating question of the role and influence of aesthetics in mathematical thinking and the pursuit of truth. For the equation phobes in the audience, and I know you're there, uh, I urge you not to be put off uh, by the appearance of the occasional equation on the screen because you will find, I think, that Bob's explanation will be both fun and beautiful. So please uh, join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker tonight, Bob May. I took it upon myself to extend the remit to discuss the role of elegance and ultimately beauty in mathematics in its role of helping us simply to advance the quest that is as old as humanity to try and understand the workings of the world around us. And the talk I'm going to give is going essentially to have three parts. I'm going to begin with the narrower remit of suggesting to you some of the reasons why I think mathematics really is both can be amazing in ways that I find aesthetically pleasing. But I'm going to do that as a background to then giving some examples of how questions of aesthetic satisfaction have shaped really important advances in science. And I'm going to conclude with a brief look forward 
to some of the larger questions that this opens, which I'm going to explore in the next two lectures. Um, and uh, the banking lecture is partly because it's something I've been drawn into, but partly because it's something that I think illustrates very interestingly the way we suffer from an enterprise, which is what most of the financial system is, which, where the mode of discourse is still pre-enlightenment and would be much more familiar to Socrates Athens than it would to a post-enlightenment scientist. Okay, so here we go. Fasten your seat belts. And I would begin by observing that the primary, the most important thing that distinguishes humanity from the rest of the fascinating array of animals that populate our world is our clear and deliberate quest for an understanding of how we got here and how the world works. And the first stirrings of that are lost in the mists of myths and mysticism that leave their relics in stone circles and wonderful paintings of enigmatic meaning in caves. And insofar as the early quest did have a foundation, it was in practical, descriptive things looking at the movement of the stars, which in those days, without street lights, you could see. <laughs> Pondering the mystic uh, resonance between the period of one month of the moon and the resonance with the menstrual period. Pondering things with learning by doing of medicinal use of plants and nutrient values of plants in a way that prefigured and still persists, although often in rather silly ways uh, today. And from that emerged the foundations of mathematics, which are more recent and have an immense appeal because they're about things that you really can prove with no ifs and buts, like two sides of a triangle are equal, then the two angles in the triangle will be equal, and there you are. You're not going to, nobody can mess around with that. <laughs> so let me take that as the first example. I remember when I entered high school, start, first became acquainted with geometry at the age of 12, and we started to go through Euclid's book of theorems. And the first one is this, that says, if you've got an isosceles triangle so that AB equals AC, then prove the two angles are equal. And the teacher went ahead then and did what, I, what Pythagoras did, uh, what I saw, um, what's his name, the bloke Euclid did, and you drop a perpendicular and then you say the side, a, in the, tri the side AB equals the side AC, and the side going from A down to the bottom of the perpendicular is common to the two triangles. So they've got two sides equal and the same right angle at the bottom. Therefore, they're congruent. Therefore, the angles are equal. And I, uh, at that time, early in the first uh, term in school, um, set a pattern for which uh, I was become, to become unpopular by saying, surely it's just completely bloody obvious that <laughs> by symmetry that the, if the sides are equal, the angles are equal. But uh, I was assured, no, no, we're going to prove things rigorously. And I was thus pleased. One of the first things I learned when I, I came as a postdoc to Harvard in 1959, I was in the Division of Engineering and Applied Physics, and so there will be people in the audience who would have known people there, and particularly George Carrier. And I remember one of our first lunches, he told me of something that had happened a few years earlier in the beginnings of computers and artificial intelligence. Some group of people had had the very nice idea of testing their artificial intelligence program by giving it Euclid's theorems. And they particularly thought this would be a good one because you've got to make an imaginative extra construction in order and I want to go backward here, 
You know, you've got to put something in to prove it. What did the computer do? The computer said the triangle ABC and the triangle ACB are congruent. <laughs> AB and AC, uh, sorry, the side AB equals the side AC, and the side AC equals the side AB, and the angle is common, therefore those two triangles are congruent, so the angle, which is a refinement of the symmetry argument, and I think that's beautiful. I give you another thing which I think is one of the most magic things in mathematics and some will be familiar and some will find it uh, simply reinforcing their belief that some of it is silly um, of the definition, and I'm doing this not lightly because it's leading me somewhere else, of complex numbers. You start with the equation, we're looking for the unknown number x which has the property then when you multiply it by itself, x squared add to it twice itself, 2x, and 2, you get 0. And what's the number? Well, you can go about this another way. You can say, well, x squared plus 2x plus 1 plus 1 equals 0, but x squared plus 2x plus 1 is just x plus 1 squared. So you've got x plus 1 squared equals 1, or x plus 1 squared equals minus 1, and now we'll take the square root. x plus 1 is the square root of minus 1. A square root of minus 1? A number that when you multiply it by itself gives you minus 1? I mean, that's a nonsense. If you multiply, two minuses give you a plus. There is no way, it's, it's an imaginary number. Well, let us be bold. We will say the solution is x equals minus 1 plus or minus this imaginary number, and we'll christen it, we'll call it i, an imaginary number. And this sounds like a lot of loony stuff. But look where it leads. We've now, in a sense, got a curious way of playing with numbers in a two-dimensional way. One of the dimensions is the real axis of sensible real numbers that you could use with the butcher or the supermarket. The other is another line perpendicular to it of these so-called imaginary numbers which uh, a real number multiplied by the square root of minus 1. So why are we doing this? Well, we've constructed a rather elegant and sometimes useful way, as I'll show you in a moment, of doing complicated things in two dimensions that are, take us in some interesting directions. One of the things we can do, and I'm not going to go into this in detail, one of the things we could also describe this complex number z which is the real number x plus the imaginary number i, y, an ordinary number y times i, we could also measure it by its distance from where the horizontal and the vertical line intersect, the origin, and the distance from that to the point, and the angle that that line makes, polar coordinates. And if we did that and did some fancy stuff, we would end up with one of the most magical formulae in science. It's a formula that makes alchemy look ordinary. <laughs> it, it's genuine mysticism in a sense. It's got two fundamental constants, E, the base of natural logarithms. This, it's a number. It's a number that emerges from asking what is the mathematical function or thing which describes things where the rate at which they change is proportional to their magnitude? Something, if you've had, for example, something that was putting on weight and the faster it put on weight, the faster it put on more weight, and that, do that mathematically and it'll give you this fundamental constant. Pi is the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle. I is this ridiculous seeming thing. And you put them all together and you get something ordinary like minus one. Of course, some people have a more pragmatic attitude to this. One of my favorite things of some of the 
astonishing things that have happened in this wonderful country is it, it, toward the end of the 1800s, the Wisconsin legislature got a bit fed up with the fact that pi was such an awkward number and actually legislated to redefine pi to be 3.2. I kid you not, it was done on behalf of the construction industry because it would make carpentry easier. And the thing I find puzzling about it actually is not that they did it, but that if you're going to make it simpler, why not make it three for God's sake? <laughs> and I, have to, I regret to tell you that it never made its way into law because the governor vetoed it. I'm now going to move on to something weirder and with more practical applications and it is the following thing. This is the so-called, this is something that I came across and I was by no means the first when I accidentally got interested and moved from my chair in theoretical physics at Sydney um, to Princeton's biology department and I got accidentally interested in questions of ecology as part of, uh, part of uh, essentially um, the troubled times of the late 1950s and uh, Vietnam and caring about the environment. And I tried, started trying to find out what I was really caring about. And I came across this notion of what regulates natural populations. And a very oversimplified metaphor is this sort of little equation here that says the number of, say, knapweed gall flies in Whiteham Woods outside Oxford next year, T plus one, is going to be equal to the number of animals there with there this year, X of T, times the number of offspring they had, which will let be a constant A, but it can't go growing indefinitely. We've got to recognize in the real world if X gets to be too big, too many animals, then either food limitations or attracting predators or various other things will tend to cut that back and they're not all their off offspring will survive. So a metaphor for that, a deliberately oversimplified version, is to say the next X is the X we got at the moment times 1 minus the X times the constant. A 10-year-old could iterate that on a hand calculator. What's going to happen to a population like that? Well, the, the firm curve there shows in terms of how many there were this year along the x-axis, how many there'll be next year. And the dashed line represents a population that doesn't change. And you'll see if it's at levels less than that, the population will grow. And if it's at levels bigger than that, it'll decay. But the basic question is, how does that equation then behave if you let it just run? And the answer is, as many in the audience by this time will know, but as was not at all fully understood or even appreciated, is that the phenomenon existed if you indeed go back to the late 1950s. If the constant A is if it's less than one, then the population just dies out because it doesn't leave enough descendants in each generation. If it's between one and three, what happens is what you'd intuit. It settles to some steady value held there by the density dependence that says if you're too big, you decrease, too small, you increase. Once you go past three, the population starts regular oscillations up and down. Once you go about beyond about 3.6 or 3.7, it starts behaving apparently almost randomly. If you were to plot the fixed points, now by fixed points we mean the points where the actual map intersects nothing changing, the dotted line, so the of course, these fixed points may or may not be stable points. They may be, as it were, like marbles in the bottom of a cup. The bottom of the cup is a stable fixed point. They may be like a marble poised on a, a tip of a pool cue. It be an unstable fixed point. And what you see here is the initial 
value of a steady value flips to an up-down cycle and then that bifurcates to give you a four-point cycle and so on and so forth. And I had rediscovered all that for myself and was giving a seminar at Maryland and I said, and finally it comes to a point of accumulation where you can just get anything and it just looks like random and I don't know what's going on. And Jim York at Maryland had just published his paper period three implies chaos. He hadn't, he was unaware of the period doubling phenomenon that took you there, but he'd proved in that other vacant area toward the end, that's where you get a th period three first period. And he had shown that if you have one of these nonlinear difference equations that will give you a period three orbit, then as you change the parameters, you will be able to find every integer period. But the really interesting thing about all this is not, it turns out, various other people had discovered the mathematics, but they were all very pure mathematicians. The first person who did it published in Finnish in 19, the late 1940s, I think. Ulam here, along with Metropolis and Stein, had stumbled on the phenomenon but not quite got it. It's very unusual for Stan. Um, and there has been a little bit of retrospective history writing uh, here. But um, I'd say he got very close. But Jim York says, we weren't the first to find it, but boy, we were the last to find it. <laughs> because we jumped up and down and said what it meant. And this is what it really meant. Not only does this look messy in the chaotic region, but it's so sensitive to the initial conditions that you can't, even though you know the rules and there's nothing random in them, it's all deterministic, you still can't make predictions. Look at this. Here's the quadratic map with A equals 3.8. So the next X, 3.8, X, 1 minus X. Let's start with x is 0.3, that's the solid line. Let's make a mistake of one part in a thousand. Let's start with x is 0.301. For the first few iterates, you can't tell the difference. But by the time you're about 10 or 12 iterates out, you've got totally different predictions. This is a really, it's not just weird, but this is the end of the Newtonian dream. I mean, when I was a graduate student, it was thought that with increasing computer power, we would get better and better weather predictions because we knew the equations, Navier Stokes, and we could put more realistic models of the Earth and on. But to summarize it, and the best account of this, uh, the best summary of the change this makes, I think, is found in Tom Stoppard's Arcadia where one of the characters is working on... Actually, I'm very fond of this particular play. Um, some will be familiar with it, some not. My most read publication is the program notes about chaos for Arcadia. <laughs> and by two orders of magnitude, that's my most cited work, except it has no citations, then it illustrates the nonsense of judging people's scientific productivity by counting the citations. But I digress. <laughs> but in that play, Valentine says, we're better at predicting events at the edge of the galaxy or inside the nucleus of an atom than whether it'll rain on Auntie's garden party three Sundays from now. We can't even predict the next drip from a dripping tap when it gets irregular. Each drip sets up the conditions for the next. The smallest variation blows prediction apart. The weather is unpredictable in the same way. We'll always be unpredictable. We'll probably never be able to do local weather beyond about 20 days. Mark you, climate change is something different. That's not weather. And saying you don't because you can't trust the weather report you can't trust climate change. It's a bit like saying, uh, I can't tell when the next wave is going to break on Bondi Beach, so I don't believe in tides. <laughs> <laughs> Again, some of the most colourful characters in the early days of chaos, after it came centre stage, were 
Santa Fe, Doyne Farmer and the Santa Cruz kids, wonderfully imaginative, colourful people. But if you thought that was weird, this is even better. Most people think, for those who are familiar with the Mandelbrot set and fractals and stuff, don't associate it with chaos. But it's basically, it's just two-dimensional chaos. Suppose we put together, and after this I'm going to become less mathematical, suppose we put together, on the one hand, the complex numbers, and on the other hand, what we've just seen with the one-dimensional quadratic map, and look at, let the number in the next x is a x 1 minus x, let that x be z, a complex number. In effect, all that does is take our one-dimensional system into two dimensions. And so now we've got a more complicated pair of equations, which I won't go into detail about. We've got a more complicated next x, which depends on both x and y, and I'm going to have to explore what's going to happen in two dimensions rather than along a line and the value, what the value a is doing. And this is just, don't you close your eyes if you wish on this bit. <laughs> Most people don't realize the intimate association between what I'm about to show you and the stuff on chaos and the quadratic map because it's usually written as the next z complex z is z squared plus c. We just had a very good program on chaos at the BBC and the chap who made it treated these, this is a completely different topic from what I've just been talking about. It's the same topic and you can see that uh, because you've just got to redefine what Z is and that's what that's about. But the really interesting thing is what happens. I'm going to show you what happens if you look, I showed you the bifurcation diagram, the fixed points of the one dimensional thing. Now I'm going to show you the fixed points of that two dimensional system. And these are the things that Benoit Mandelbrot publicized. Interestingly, among mathematicians, he never got much credit. He was a sort of pushy bloke. And people said, but Julia looked at this set, so you're not the first. Point is, Julia just saw it as a mathematical curiosity, whereas Benoit Mandelbrot, again, wasn't the first person to find it, but he was the last in this area. And the prize that was given, the big Kyoto Prize, same scale as the Nobel but less status, that was given for complex systems a few years ago, in my opinion, went to the right two people, Jim York and Benoit Mandelbrot. What he did is he plotted the fixed points of that pair of equations, a two-dimensional quadratic map, complex numbers, uh, in, with the com this real numbers x and the complex numbers with the real part y. So those are the fixed points. That's what the boundary looks like. It's a, a figure which actually, with the value of a that he chose, has a total area that can be enclosed in a circle of radius 2.5 about the origin which is somewhere here. And that itself is sort of complicated enough, but if you, a lot of the fine detail is just fuzzed out there. If you look into more of the detail, the closer you look, the more you find, and you can go into one of the twiddles and any around the fringe and blow it up and you get stuff like this. And you can go into one of these twiddles like this and blow it up and you get stuff like this. It's absolutely enchantingly gorgeous. But not only is it beautiful, it is saying something really very profound, more profound than this. This is, a crop, this is something, there's a great craze for crop circles in Britain and there are lots of people in Britain who believe that this has all come from outer space. Yes, I, I suppressed the uh, ad lib there. <laughs> what we realize much better than we used to, I mean, 
I'm coming now into the second, and they're not all of equal length, uh, part of the talk about the role of mathematics in actually understanding the world. We can go back to Galileo and the early days of mathematics in science and when he enunciated his belief that the grand book wasn't too pleasing to the relevant Pope who thought the grand book was written essentially by his apparatus, apparatchiks. Uh, the grand book is written in the language of mathematics and its characters are triangles, circles and other geometric objects. Post Mandelbrot we realize the great book is written in mathematics, yes, uh, but the objects aren't triangles and circles and squares. Instead of the triangles, we have fractal geometries. Instead of the nice regular orbits, we have strange attractors. Instead of regular cycles, we have messy things. Going right back to this, also we're introduced to a novel idea that is important. I said the area of this gorgeous set of fixed points is finite, but the boundary, which ought to be a line ultimately, is infinite. And it introduced us to this word fractal geometries, the geometries that where the lines aren't necessarily one dimensional. The coastlines of most countries have fractal geometries. Now, all that was by way of background to other lectures that will come in the fullness of time. About how much we know the journey we're still embarked on and what guides us. Galileo is not that really all that different from Keats in enunciating the view that elegance is part is, is a reliable guide in the quest for understanding the real world. The Enlightenment says something in many ways a bit different. I mean, the real, our progress up to the Enlightenment is one that really was heavily focused on ideas of things being beautiful. And even Newton, I mean, the idea of the, the, the mathematics in that is important. Most people, I think, don't realize the first application of calculus, and in fact the motivating thing for calculus, is because he wanted to confirm his intuition that in doing gravitational calculations, when you had a sphere like the Earth or the Sun, you could validly replace it by a point at the center. And to do that and put it into the gravitational equation requires calculus. But the Enlightenment well, went well beyond that it, it's because it said you don't appeal to beauty and truth, you also want experiments and things like that. I think nonetheless, while that is true, I don't think, I mean there's a personal belief that you may not share, I, I believe that elegance has, is an inherent part of the quest. And I'm going to give you two of the really notable illustrations of that, the first of which will be familiar to you and the second one perhaps less. The first one is special relativity and its implications and that all comes as you know from a really important experiment that was done um, which was an experiment to try and show um, just how fast we were moving through space, as it were, and find out what was the speed of light and how it depended on movement. And it produced the ridiculous answer that the speed of light, the only thing consistent with the experiment was that the speed of light was an absolute constant independent of whether the way the observer was moving. I mean, if you're trying to measure 
the speed of a car that's going along the interstate at 60 miles an hour, it doesn't matter whether you're standing beside it. If you're standing beside it, you'll see it go at 60 miles an hour. If you're driving alongside it at 50 miles an hour, then you'll see its relative speed is 10 miles an hour. But if the car was moving at the speed of light, it wouldn't move whether you, matter whether you were moving at half the speed of light, which ultimately you couldn't do because the observations make it clear the speed of light is the speed of light independent of its motion, the light's motion relative to the observer. And that just means the laws of physics were fundamentally in error. It meant that what if speed of light is constant, it must mean that the fundamental, intuitive things that you, clearly you would think of as just independent verities, like the length of a meter stick or the time from your time you were born and your twin was born, must be dependent on circumstance. And it was, an, in its time, an extraordinary leap that Einstein undertook. What he effectively did, I'm on the wrong page of my notes, and I don't know what I did with the other one, with the page I want, and it doesn't really matter, except I would like to find it. So if I want to put it precisely. So what he said was, I'm going to put this in a framework that assumes speed of light is constant and the laws of physics are the same at all times and all places. That means I'm going to have to redefine what I mean by the coordinates of space, x, y, and z in the three-dimensional space we inhabit, and time, these four variables. And I'm going to have to construct a set of equations, a way of thinking about this in an elegant and self-consistent way that is respectful for the crucial experiments. So it's a mixture of elegance and a surprising fact and see how it all works. And I'm not going to try and take you through that in detail. I'm just going to say that one of the consequences that emerges is that it means that whereas in elementary physics you'd think of momentum of a particle is its mass times its velocity, but its velocity is now involving measurements and times which are not absolute. And when you put that correction in, in a way that's consistent with the absolute constancy of the speed of light, you find that you've got to modify the definition of momentum from mass times velocity, which you observe, to mass times velocity divided by the square root of 1 minus the square on the velocity over the square of the velocity of light. But that has wider implications. So if you're going to put together equation now for energy, you find in the scheme that Einstein put forward, that you've hit upon the notion that there must be an inherent rest energy associated with any mass, and that that rest energy corresponds to its mass times the square on the speed of light. And it comes from preserving the symmetries in the equations, and it appears really, again, ludicrous until you begin to see if you can test the conclusions. Well, of course, one of the conclusions is if mass is lost, as it is in nuclear fusion, in nuclear fission, when things, uh, um, atom splits apart, when the mass is lost, that energy's got to appear in some other form. However counterintuitive that may have appeared, that beauty-inspired formulation found its proof in the blossoming of the first mushroom cloud not that far away from here in the deserts of Nevada. And we fully appreciate today how such lost mass exists and how devastating these other forms can be. Of course, in everyday life, 
you don't see much of this. Actually, if you want to get into the technicalities, the Einsteinian formulation gives you the top equation there, and you fiddle around with it, and you end up with the definition that the energy in special relativity is going to be the mass times c squared divided by that factor thing. And if you then approximate that for v over c very tiny, you recover classical physics apart from the rest energy, which is in a sense not observable as long as it's not been messed around with. You just get e as a half the mass times the velocity squared. So it's consistent with what you knew, but it has huge implications. On the other hand, important though this is, and wildly counterintuitive though it might be, it pales in comparison with my second example, which is Dirac. This is Dirac's memorial in Westminster Abbey, and it contains in the simplest form of the equation that came from his thinking, which I will now outline in broad principle. Dirac set himself the task of unifying two things. He wanted to take quantum mechanics, which was also a new thing of the 1920s, 1930s, the recognition that when you get down to the molecular atomic level, conventional notions of space and time are also interrupted there and you, instead of describing things deterministically, you have an equation, the Schrodinger equation, which gives you probability distributions for what particles will do. But this was all otherwise in, within the framework of classical physics and then he wanted to put it together with, make it with relativity to have a unified framework there that would be relevant at very high velocities. The equation he got is this, I'll clear away the confusing detail, and he written like this, it's not nearly as simple as it looks. Gamma represents a 4x4 four four matrix. It's a 4x4 four four matrix operating on the four the vector quantity with four components, which are the three dimensions of space, x, y, and z, and the dimension of time. And this thing, delta, is a vector operator that tells you the rate at which, in response to things going on around it, each of these components, x, y, z, and time, are changing. It's, a, it's essentially it's the derivative of this thing, psi, and psi is essentially the Schrodinger wave equation. It's the thing that tells you the probability distribution of these four quantities of space-time. That's the relation between them, and all uh, lots of numerical constants and things have been factored out of this, but it also has, just illustrating its mystical quantity, the thing I began with, the imaginary number, managed to get into this equation in Westminster Abbey. But the thing that's really utterly, and to my mind, almost unbelievable about this, Dirac, Dirac of course, wanted to understand, now I've got this equation, and it's predicting, in effect, it's telling me about the dynamics in relation to the four dimensions of space and time of four quantities, which are the other part of the four times four matrix gamma. So what are these four fundamental particles? Two of them are electrons, which everyone's familiar with. They're electrons of two kinds, those with spins up and those with spins down, but they're electrons, positive relativistic rest energy, negative charge. What are the other two? They've got to be things with spin up and one with spin up and one with spin down. They've got to have negative rest energy and positive charge. And at first Dirac hoped they might be protons, the electrons companions in the atom. But the protons are 2,000 times heavier 
the whole symmetry is destroyed and clearly wasn't them. So what he, he saw as the way out of this, I think the boldest leap in science, he said, let me assume that the entire cosmos is such that it is completely filled with these two missing kinds of stuff. So we can't see it because it's just there everywhere, not doing anything. The only way we can see it is when there are some holes where a bit's missing. And then we'll see the hole because the hole will have the property of having negative rest energy, positive charge, spin up or spin down. And let's call it a positron, the cousin never seen and only there in this scheme by virtue of the fact that our entire universe is permeated by filling up all the positron slots. And what we're seeing are the holes. It's a theory of holes for positrons. I mean, the wildest flight of mathematics and beauty, counterintuitive, but with elegance as a guide. And I imagine if one had lived at that time and uh, wanting to take a bet on it, you would have got very good odds that this was all nonsense. But it did have a virtue. It had a virtue with actually string theory, today's analog of pursuit of beauty in trying to understand the world, does not have. It had a testable prediction. So it was, while guided in this more aesthetic way, it was in the idiom of the Enlightenment. Whereas I think uh, you have a bit of trouble defending string theory as being in the idiom of the Enlightenment, but I digress. The prediction was it made a specific prediction, A, that you might find these positrons and holes, and also it made spe specific predictions about the magnetic moment of electrons, and a couple of years later, in 1932, these were verified. And pleasingly, he got the Nobel Prize with amazing rapidity. I mean, it took him 20 years to give uh, Einstein his. They gave him his next year. And he really deserved it. It's interesting that everyone's heard of Einstein, and very few people have heard of Dirac. There's a wonderful book just been written about him called The Strangest Man by Graham Farmelow, which I commend. Einstein courted publicity. Dirac shunned it. And the, I find fascinating not just the two most brilliant examples of elegance and imagination, but at the same time Dirac's much better, in two such different people. Okay, in conclusion, I'd just like to uh, foreshadow very quickly for, because I know not everybody will be able to make it tomorrow, although um, my recommendation, of course, would be you should record the debate. But um, <laughs> I'm going to go on a bit about the aspects of the banking problem and uh, the way we're going about dealing with it. But what I'm really going to try and focus on is that many of the questions that confront us today, and specifically in banking and more generally in some of other things, actually lie outside the domain of, to of today's science. Some of them, even though they're squarely within the idiom of science, like climate change, and some of which are essentially outside the idiom of science but are still rather atavistically rooted in belief systems and appeals to authority. And maybe as we learn more about neuroscience and the, evil, the ecology and evolution of behavior of individuals and communities, this will change but I'm going to take the liberty of speculating in the concrete context 
of banking things about some of these issues and then more generally in the way the problems that we face in tomorrow's world we are not addressing well as a result of our failure to understand much of what we need to understand about ourselves. And uh, I think on that note I should stop because it's about time. Incidentally, people who have to leave should leave uninhibited by the fact that we are having questions. <laughs> I'd put it somewhere in, I mean, I repeat the question. I mean, I talked about special relativity and then Dirac was working on reconciling quantum mechanics with special relativity. And the question was, Einstein went on to what was, uh, I mean, it, the special relativity is anchored in the fact that this velocity of light is a universal constant. Going on to general relativity, you enter into domains which are guided much more by an aesthetic feeling for it. And I would rank it in that, in that sense, really significantly higher than special relativity, but still nowhere near <laughs> Dirac. The guts to suggest that the thing that's missing, that you've predicted and it isn't there, is isn't there because it's everywhere and all you're going to see are the holes, that took courage. Ah, well, I mean, we start making a, a rank-ordered list of, uh, of the great... The oh, the re question again, where would I ra write Maxwell, who took a set of phenomena that, for example, electricity and magnetism, which people thought were separate things, and Maxwell said, let, let me think about this, and I can put this all together into, again, into a unified framework where I get a beautiful set of equations that uh, explain all the known facts about electricity and magnetism, but also have some interesting suggestions about applications we make that we haven't thought of yet. I would rank it very highly. I'm reluctant to get too far into this game of uh, ranking things uh, this way because the, f the giants upon whose shoulders we stand uh, did so many remarkable things. But I do, uh, personally, because I myself would be I, incapable of the sorts of things that Dirac did. Whereas I'm not sure that, given the right circumstances and cultural things, th the systematic codification that someone like Maxwell did, I can see how you could do it. And that doesn't mean it's better or worse, it's just that I'm more bowled over by Dirac. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to start again. My hearing's not as good as it could be. This is a really great question, and if I may rephrase it, the question is, uh, as building on observations increase, which increasingly showed that the things in the heavens didn't move round in circles, Ptolemy put together 
this more complicated thing which however was still constrained by the fact that even though there were circles within circles everything had to be circles and going a bit further than that there's a, a one of, there are lots of things that one does learn in school uh, which are so firmly embedded that that's what's always taught but just don't happen to be true uh, and one of them is that uh, Copernicus realized that uh, the earth moved around the sun rather than the sun around the earth the story is much more complicated what Copernicus recognized what Ptolemy had done by putting epi having the planets move round the sun the the earth rather everything moved around the earth and in more or less in circles but then there were little epicycle circles what he had done was construct for the sun round the earth and it doesn't matter whether it's the sun round the earth or the earth round the sun anyhow because it's just a relative motion what he'd constructed with his epicycles was an ellipse which we actually have correct to second order in the eccentricity of the ellipse and what Copernicus did was not necessarily say the earth goes round the sun or the sun round the earth because it's relative motion and both are right or wrong but what he did he displaced and he made it more convenient and incurred the wrath that descended on him by making the sun at the center and but the main thing he did was displace the sun from the center so that the earth went in a circle round was displaced by the distance that he displaced the sun from the center of the circle and that also just like Ptolemy gave you an ellipse to second order in the eccentricity so there were two different approximations to what eventually when Kepler put it all together and realized that equal arcs were swept out in equal times and then Newton realized that implied an inverse square law of gravitation but nonetheless it was an example of being trapped not just using beauty as a guide but being for Ptolemy being trapped in a world that was so caught up with rather dogmatic views about what you meant by beauty that everything had to be in circles and Copernicus broke that and in breaking it because he chose to put the sun at the middle or rather he could put the earth at the center and displaced it and had the sun and got all the same predictions um, he's misrepresent he did indeed suggest maybe that the earth moved around the sun but as I say they're moving relatively that's not the really the big deal it's presented I missed I missed the that sentence. Do I really believe that inherently Well, I'd never think about the question that way. Mathematics is on the one hand a toolkit, but on the other hand I just find it an aesthetically pleasing toolkit. And that's, this, yeah, I mean, I, I, th I what, what mathematics is, and I'd meant to say this actually on the way through, it was one of the bits where I realized I skipped over something and didn't go back. What mathematics really is, it is a tool for thinking clearly. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a powerful tool for thinking analytically, dispassionately, rigorously putting down what you've assumed in an unambiguous way and when you say that it makes it sound dead boring but it is a hugely important tool on the other hand if you take it to the extent that you think that is the only lock you need it's the only keyhole you need a key to then you'll be trapped in what in the kind of Socratic dialogues that preceded 
the invention of the scientific method where yes you think clearly about what your ideas mean but then you go on and try and test it rather than have the argument with someone who disagrees about whether your belief system is better than their belief system. So I, I see the mathematics itself, as I say, as a way of thinking clearly. It can be very pleasing, but it's not going to make much progress in helping you understand how the world really works unless you also get your hands dirty. Basically, I do tend to like things that I find pleasing and elegant as much of mathematics, but I also like things that, that make me go away feeling I understand something better than I did before I started. And it, that understanding can come in ways that are really very straightforward. Well, that's okay too. And I guess I'm quirky enough that I like it even better if the understanding comes in a way that I learn something from the journey. I come close. Yeah. Well, I was going. <laughs> when I, in B, I went, when I was introduced, the I think you referred to uses and abuses of mathematics and biology. Um, yeah. No, I'm happy to expand on that. <coughs> when I first got into ecology, um, I brought with me... I'm, I, I'm going to talk about some of this stuff tomorrow at the beginning. But what I did is, um, it was... and I'm, This is how I'm going to start tomorrow, but it was at a time when ecology is still a very young subject. It's about a hundred years... The word's only about a hundred years old. The first 50 years were very descriptive. And it was beginning to acquire a conceptual base, and it had some ideas, rather romantic ideas about the balance of nature and stuff. And I looked at them, and I thought they were a bit silly, and uh, I made a little model that it made more explicit what these ideas were and showed they were wrong. It was very interesting. There were people um, who tended to be among the more interesting people of that day, Robert MacArthur of Princeton, particularly, who just learned that he had less than a year to live. When I was on the sabbatical um, in this country at the Institute for Advanced Study with John Bacall, whom, again, some of you will have known. Um, and I had just got interested in this stuff, and I had one of my friends had written to Robert MacArthur and said, you might like to talk. And I went and talked to Robert about it. And it was quite an amazing story. It wouldn't happen today. Here, here was this person he'd never met before. And he'd lent, he, he, at the end of 10 minutes, he's, one of his colleagues came and called him, said, you want it on the phone. Then he came back. We talked for about an hour. And then he said, you know, I'm not well. I'm going to be dead within less than a year. And I'm tired now. I'm going to go home. But he said, I'm looking for my successor at Princeton. And I was hoped to get Jared Diamond, but he wants to stay on the West Coast. Would you be interested in coming here as professor in the zoology department? Absolutely gobsmacking. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I said, well, it was very flattering, but now I'm happy. And so I won't go into the story anymore. But so the reaction in short from some of the people, and obviously these are the people I respected, was this is interesting stuff and it has a part to play along with then here's a way of testing it. But the majority of people in ecology in those early days, the attitude was purely hostile. Many of them were people, and you still get it in areas I've, uh, as you go into newer areas. When Roy and I, Anderson and I started going into infectious disease, much of there, more of the reaction was positive but some of it was irrationally hostile. And my theory for some of it, which I shouldn't be confessing in front of a larger audience, is that many of these people were people who wanted to do science, really committed to it, but they couldn't do, they f were no good at math. Some of us are good at some things, some are good at other things. And they f resented the notion that math had anything to do with it because they were doing this kind of science precisely because you didn't need any mathematics. <laughs> 
<laughs> so my, my feeling is that there are all sorts of different people and the hard science, the so-called hard sciences are the easy sciences. The physical sciences, <coughs> there are invariance principles, there are conservation laws, Hamiltonians and stuff. It makes it easy. The life sciences are the same basic physical science, but now elaborated into functioning organisms, and it's so much more complicated. It's getting there, but it's so... And the most important sciences, I mean, I'm, I'm on the, our, one of our... Com we have legislation about climate change, which I'll also talk about briefly in the last lecture. Um, in... Uh, oh, what was I going to say? I lost, I lost the thread there, sorry. Um, yeah, oh, I'm in the habit of saying... For climate change, the most important science is the behavioral science. Much more important than the physics and stuff. And that has got all the complications of the biological sciences, and then on top of it all, in addition to all that complexity, the things you're philosophizing about hear what you're saying and it affects what they do. Right? So you, you, you're trying to think about the banking crisis. Not only you've got to try and understand what's going on in it and what you might do, but when you do do something, the people in it are going to react to what you did in ways which are not necessarily coupled in any rational way with the dynamics of the system. So there's a big hierarchy. I think the hard sciences are easy. Biological sciences are diff more difficult, but we're getting there. And the social sciences, which is the most important for our collective future, we're way behind 